In this episode, Tom and Matt take a look at the recent guilty plea by Lafarge for payments of bribes and protection money to ISIS in Syria in 2012 through 2014. Hello, everyone. This is Tom Fox back again with Matt Kelly for the award-winning Compliance Into the Weeds. Today, Matt and I are going to take up a criminal enforcement action, which was released last week involving Lafarge and its former Syrian subsidiary. Lafarge is a French cement company now owned by a Swiss parent, Wholesome, and it engaged in some of the most outrageous, morally bankrupt conduct I've seen in a long, long time. So with that cheery introduction, Matt, welcome. Hello, Tom. It's good to be here. So this was not an FCPA case. This was not bribery and corruption of a foreign government. It was bribery and corruption of a terrorist organization, ISIS. And it was essentially for the greater profit of the company. And you want to fill in the background and we'll go from there, Matt? Yeah, sure. I have a sort of a love-hate response to this case, because in certain ways, a lot of the details are very much like what we have heard in FCPA land before. Fake contracts, falsified invoices, corrupt intermediaries, dealing with shady third parties. That's not new. We've talked about that a lot. We will talk about it again in the future. But really, when you read through the plea deals and the statement of facts and the many statements that the Justice Department had to say. Just the fact that Lafarge's executives at the time, and this all unfolded in the roughly first half of the 2010s, really some reprehensible amoral conduct here where they uh, paid off ISIS and the Al Nursa Front, which was, I think, a subsidiary of ISIS or a split off of ISIS. Now, they were paying protection money to terrorist organizations in Syria for a cement plant that Lafarge had just built. I had out of the 85 or 90 billion brain cells in my head, I think there's maybe about three or four that are somewhat sympathetic to things that happened to Lafarge. Like they had spent $680 million to open a cement plant in Syria that opened in 2010. And then our history from there is that in 2011, Syria plunged into civil war from 2011 through probably into the late 2010s, ISIS controlled a large portion of Syria, including the northern part where Lafarge had just built its cement company. And I get it, that sucks. You spent a lot of money to open a brand new plant and right away it falls into terrorist territory. But then Lafarge decided the good idea would be to, like we said, pay protection payments to ISIS and El Nursa and not only that, but really got into a revenue sharing agreement with these two, that the payments they made to the terrorist groups were based on how much cement they could still manufacture while the plant was still open. They sort of tried to justify it as saying, this is going to keep our employees alive. And it is correct, I think. I read somewhere that several employees had been harassed and possibly killed by the terrorists already by the time this came to pass, but that doesn't mean that you then give the terrorists more and more money and align your economic interests with the terrorist groups. Now, okay, like I said, then we get to how this actually happened and the internal control provisions and the schemes, and we can get into the details of that. It will sound familiar because it's very similar to a lot of FCPA cases. And Tom, where you said it's really, it's not a foreign government, it was a terrorist organization. Let's not forget that at the time, ISIS was actually trying to be its own government. They set up tax authorities. They had passports they were issuing. They were pretending to be a real government, even though they were just terrorists. But ultimately, then you wind up with Lafarge giving money to a terrorist group that was using it to wage war, kill civilians, harass Americans, kill Americans. So we should not be surprised that the American justice system landed on them like two tons of cement. That's the, uh, the end of my jokes for this very sad commentary here. But there we are. That's it in a nutshell. So I want to pick up on a couple of things, Matt. First of all, the Wholesome, the now owner of Lafarge, yep. uh, acquired through Friendly Acquisition, had a press release in April of 2017 after the Wholesome board had concluded their internal investigation. And I just want to quote from this for the most inane, tone-deaf, 
morally bankrupt statement I think I've heard in a long time. So the first part says, quote, the board has now concluded the independent investigation and confirmed that a number of measures taken to continue safe operations at the Syria plant were unacceptable and significant errors of judgment were made that contravened the applicable code of conduct. These findings also confirm that although the measures were instigated by local and regional management, selected members of the group management were aware of these circumstances, indicating that violations of Lafarge established standards of business conduct had taken place. I'm going to get back to that one later, but here's my favorite Mm -hmm. quote. In hindsight, any misdeeds may seem clear. However, the combination of war zone chaos and the can-do approach to maintain operations in these circumstances may have caused those involved to seriously misjudge the situation and to neglect to focus sufficiently on the legal and reputational implications of their conduct, end quote. Number one, that. The first quote means that not only did the regional management know and the group managers know, in a statement of facts, the board of directors knew, the CEO knew, and the chairman knew because they quoted emails from them throughout the statement of facts, approving payments or asking for additional details to back up the need for payments. The second thing is before Syria plunged into civil after the plan opened in 2010. So in 2011, Lafarge and its subsidiary called LCS in Syria were concerned about cheap cement flooding the market from Turkey. So in 2011, they approached the then Syrian government to see if they could do something about that. Then the country got in dissolved or devolved in civil war and that immediately was put on the back burner, but it came back later because one of the reasons to keep the plant open and for the payments to ISIS was to be ready on site with employees when the war ended and not lose market share to this cheap Turkish cement. So they were uh, using this as a way to knock the competitors out. In addition to all of the other things you said, And then we have had a few discussions of FCPA enforcement actions where companies put spreadsheets together to demonstrate profitability of bribes. Here, Lafarge was not as sophisticated as putting a spreadsheet together, but I'm just going to quote that at one point, Intermediary One, the bribe payer, was quoted for the following, quote, we currently sell for eight to 10 million per month with a 2 million profit and pay less than one quarter of that for protection. Other factories are paying protection just to exist without making the profits that we are, end quote. This type of conduct or communication rather is replete throughout uh, this. The Some of the corporate home offices in officers rather in France ask for additional documentation of why the cost of paying these bribes went up. And it started off, as you said, the old fashioned way, cash, monthly payments. Uh, Then it moved to tax per truck. Uh, Then it moved to a tax, tax, that's T-A-X, per amount of cement. Then it moved to full profit sharing because they were just going to split the profits. And You can see Lafarge either going down this road voluntarily or other, but just no appreciation of what they had done. I found it interesting. Oh, I'm sorry. You want to go jump in there? No, go right ahead. It was interesting that the (coughs) plea agreement made clear that there were no U.S. domiciled individuals involved, although one of the monikered executives, I think Executive 5, was a dual French U.S. citizen, but there was no allegation he was involved in the conduct while he was inside the United States. There was, however, routing of monies through the U.S. banking system. And so I'm not sure if that's how they got jurisdiction or some other way, but if it was routing monies to the U.S. banking system, the amount was around $200,000, which led to a $600 million plus fine, I believe, once again shows that if any monies touch the U.S. in a way that creates jurisdiction, 
the whole kit and caboodle can go down. And I think there's, I'm going to write about some of the lessons learned from the bribery schemes, but the other interesting component was the communications used by the Lafarge executives, both in France and on the ground in the Middle East, where they used Gmail accounts and other communications via email outside their regular company email accounts. And it made me wonder, is the DOJ going to step in to try to require companies to somehow monitor that? I have a couple of thoughts, although I'll try and get back to the Gmail question there because I do think that's a good one. First, let me circle all the way back to when you were talking about Holson's anodyne press release from 2017, where they tried to apply the fog of war to this decision. I think the leaf blower of common sense and morality would blow all that fog right away. These are terrorists. These are thugs. There were a lot of other companies that were very clearly in similar predicaments in 2011. They all knew you get out of Syria. They all knew that ISIS is not somebody to get in bed with at all. And yet Lafarge decided that it would. That was just like full stop. That's That was a terrible idea. But I did want to circle back to some more specific compliance relevant questions and details here. I thought it was interesting that Holsom, when they acquired Lafarge in 2015, so they didn't know about this and Lafarge did not disclose it. But you would want to think, why didn't the whole sim know about this? Why didn't they ask? If you look at the statement of facts, at that time that the deal was being discussed and closed, 2014-2015, so Lafarge's operations in Syria were less than 1% of Lafarge's group sales at the time. So it's not material. Wholesome didn't specifically inquire, do you have any operations in Syria that might be troublesome? And Holson didn't ask. Lafarge didn't volunteer it. At a high level, you would look and see they don't make any serious amount of money from Syria. That can't be a big deal. And that is why this happened and why Holson didn't catch this. I think that brings up a good point about risk-based due diligence that even though financially what was going on in Syria was not material to the deal, from a compliance perspective, from a legal and moral perspective, Syria was a big risk. And so it would not have been unusual for somebody at Holson to ask, do you have any operations in Syria? Do you have any operations in other high risk areas? And we're going to look at them. And I don't care if it's 10% or less than 1% or 0.1% of total revenue. If there's a risk there, we should investigate it. And that is not what happened at Holson. And here they are. Also worth noting, how did all of this eventually come to light? It came to light when an anti-regime blog or group in Syria that was opposed to President Bashar Bashad, Assad, President Bashar Assad, a group opposed to him published this online and said, look at Lafarge over there. They're in a revenue sharing agreement with ISIS. Aren't they terrible? So really, again, a reminder of how you should do due diligence this all came to light because of an adverse media report. And if you had done proper due diligence, maybe you would have caught it. I don't necessarily know that would have happened in this specific instance. I think the adverse media started cropping up in 2016, which is when everything hit the fan after the deal had been consummated in 2015. But adverse media reports can be a very important way to find out stuff about part of an enterprise that you might otherwise overlook because Holson was overlooking a very small part of Lafarge's total opera, but you can find all sorts of very important details through an adverse media report. And that was that. And then one other sort of internal control example I would give is how did this revenue sharing actually work? Is that the ISIS customers, the end use customers paying the ISIS price, which was here, they eventually, Lafarge would give them a discount that was somewhere down here. And this little gap, that became the bribe that went to ISIS. So yet again, we have the use of discounts and improper documentation about where is this discount? Why are we giving this customer the discount? How do we know they're actually getting it? We have talked about improper documentation around discounts used to fund bribes more often than I could count on this podcast. Now, we've never talked about it in terms of terrorists before, but yet again, why do these things matter? And Tom, why do you and I talk about them until we're blue in the face? Because 
these are glaring weaknesses that could be exploited in all manner of ways. Hadn't seen it exploited in this way until now, but here it is again. And ISIS wound up, not ISIS, Lafarge wound up paying an obscene amount of money for what is a really not a lot of upside. They didn't make a lot of money on this arrangement to justify the, I think it was 700 million or so in penalty. Plus, I don't even know. 778 million. How much more in legal costs and whatnot? Total disaster. Like, really, the juice was not worth the squeeze on this, and they never should have done it. But there are, when you get into the details, a lot of nitty-gritty that should sound very familiar to FCPA compliance veterans. And that's a great point because something that was so small and so non-material probably cost wholesome over $1 billion when you factor in the legal cost and related additional costs beyond the fine and penalty. There's a couple of other things that I want to raise, Matt. You spoke about the way this came to light, and the plea agreement makes clear that the criminal conduct was not self-reported to the Department of Justice, and Wholesome did not credit for timely and full cooperation with the investigation. So it's a little bit unclear how that could have happened at least as far back as the press release when you would have thought they would have said, we are going to cooperate and try to reduce overall fine and penalty. So there was no reduction there. It's unclear if the model would have been around the FCPA, corporate enforcement policy, those types of discounts, but we never got to that point. The other thing is that as not as important as the sales side of this for generating income was that Lafarge took on ISIS as a supplier. So ISIS controlled supply companies. They sold product to Lafarge. So at one point it was coming and going to ISIS from Lafarge. There were two other things that intrigued me about this overall settlement, Matt, and I want to see if I can pull up. Uh, This first one comes to us from the Law 360 article, which Mm -hmm. was reported by Pete Brush, who posted last week on this. He attended the hearing, and he quoted the U.S. District Judge, William Kahn, when accepting Lafarge's guilty plea, he said, this case impacts the Victim of Terrorist Act. I went and looked up the Victim of Terrorist Acts, and that gives victims of terrorism the right to sue those who are doing business with terrorists. So the query I have that I hope we'll get some clarity on is, can victims of ISIS, direct, indirect, those who can tie the monies to Lafarge or not, have a cause of action against Wholesome? which that could be a massive amount of money. And that's both U.S. citizens and those non-U.S. citizens outside the U.S. So it's a pretty broad net of who can be a set of terrorists, or excuse me, of victims. The second part was the plea agreement, and you and I talked about this a little bit earlier, stated, quote, Lafarge's commitment in attachment B to guarantee the mm-hmm. defendant's compliance with the terms of this agreement. We debated, did this relate to CCO certification or something along those lines? And I think the use, unfortunately, we don't have Exhibit B to be able to read the language. When you use the word guarantee, to me, that's a little bit different. Actually, it's a lot different than the certification. And if a company's guaranteeing the full settlement agreement, the plea agreement, that includes everything including having a functioning and effective compliance program going forward. And I don't know if a bond was posted or I don't know if additional penalties would be levied or something else, but I'm very intrigued by that word guarantee. That was something else that had occurred to me. You can't say that they don't have a DPA because they pleaded guilty. They have a three-year probation term. So really, if there is a future incident, they have violated their probation. And what do you do for a company that violates the probation? And that does remain unclear to me as well. I would love to know, and I also would be curious if this does not involve, does not require some sort of CCO certification of the effectiveness of the program, why not? I am no fan of this entire CCO certification idea, but if we're going to do it, 
this seems like a case where really, of course, it should be part of that settlement. And I'm not entirely clear on is it or is it not? What did we guarantee and who's doing the guaranteeing? And we don't have enough clarity on that question. Tom, one thing that jumped out to me that I wanted to talk about is that so Deputy Assistant, uh, Deputy Attorney General Lisa Monaco, she described this entire incident as, quote, a vivid reminder of how corporate crime can intersect with national security. And I suspect there are a whole lot of compliance officers listening right now who would say, yeah, this is really bad, but we're not that bad. We're not going to get into bed with terrorists. Really? Because let's remember that point about how a corporate crime can spill into a national security concern when you are making a ransomware payment. Who are you paying? What are their affiliations? Do you really know where that money is going? Because the department has already said that, no, it's not illegal to make a ransomware payment. And I think there are many circumstances where that would be wise if, say, they are threatening the life of innocent civilians. They've shut down, I don't know, healthcare equipment at a hospital system unless you make a payment. Yeah, make the payment. But if you are making these payments without really any care about where is that money going and is it going to violate economic sanctions or violate or to fund terrorism, then yeah, you would have a big problem. And the best way to get ahead of that would be when you make a ransomware, call law enforcement right away. See if you can stall for time while you're on the phone with the FBI asking, what do we do? And we really have to make this payment. There's life and liberty or there's life in jeopardy. But I think that if you pause and realize what Monica was saying, she is saying, if you make ransomware payments without a care in the world, it's no big deal. We're just going to miss quarterly sales of our widgets by two or three days. So yeah, we're going to mail this payment off to ISIS.com email address and big deal. I think that is tremendously stupid. And that is the sort of thing that the Justice Department would be really upset about. So anybody who would say you have to be really dumb to get into bed with terrorists, terrorists don't always look like ISIS. They don't always look like the Al Nursa front. Sometimes they look like the jackass who managed to get in and wage a ransomware attack against your systems and you don't know who they are. That doesn't mean you don't make the ransomware payment. I don't think you should, but there may be times when you need to. But clearly, work with law enforcement when you have a ransomware attack, because otherwise you're going to step on a landmine. And Monaco has already said, if you step on it hard enough, they, yes, it will blow up in your face. That's a great point. And I think she has made that absolutely clear. And you could, I could not have said any of that better. So, well, any fi final thoughts on this case from you? I do think that this case is probably rare. I don't think that we're going to launch a wave of security cases about companies that were in bed with ISIS. This was a tremendous lapse in judgment on the part of the Lafarge executives, who we should remember, if anyone is wondering about individual accountability, of these executives who were implicated in this settlement are also facing criminal charges personally in France, which is fine. Most of them seem to be French citizens and it was a French company, but they are going to wind up facing individual accountability there. Just that yet again, if you read through it, there's an awful lot of ways that this is very similar to an FCPA scheme. And it just is a good reminder about all the block and tackle internal controls you should have in place to not fall into this. Up to and including using good judgment from the very start. I would add for me, Matt, that it is not necessarily a material event, material person, material sale, material profit that can get you literally a billion dollars worth of trouble and that the smallest amount of money or email traffic or anything else that touches the U.S. system can bring U.S. full U.S. jurisdiction upon you if you're a non-U.S. company. So I do agree that uh, maybe I should say, I hope we don't see too many cases like this down the road and see what next week brings. All right, Tom. Thank you. This is Tom Fox again. Thank you for listening to this episode of Compliance Into the Weeds. I hope you will subscribe, rate, and review to this podcast, either on YouTube or any of our podcast channels, such as iTunes, Spotify, Megaphone, or the Compliance Podcast Network. Compliance Into the Weeds is a production of the Compliance Podcast Network.